Hello and welcome to Joy in Our Town. I'm your host, Vanessa Rose. So happy that you decided to tune in and join us for another great edition today. We hope to bring some joy and some wonderful information into your home today. We are so happy to be joined by Michael W. Smith, and he is a licensed counselor with House of Healing here in Phoenix, Arizona. Thank you so much for joining us today, Indeed, Michael. it's my pleasure. Always a pleasure to have you. You always have wonderful information to share with our viewing audience. And today we're going to be speaking about family and a couple topics that maybe are a little more serious and things that people don't want to address necessarily, but that are really affecting so many people's lives. But before we get into that, if you wouldn't mind uh, just sharing a little bit about yourself and what you do for our viewing audience that hasn't seen you and that doesn't know you. Oh, well, sure. I've been a counselor here in Phoenix, in Maricopa County. For, this is my 34th year. And I do a kind of a wide range of counseling services from individual counseling to family counseling and therapy. And also uh, at our counseling center at the House of Healing, we incorporate spirituality into the process. So in uh, 2007 and I think 2010, the American Psychological Association did a, published a couple of research studies and they took two different groups, one that had no spirituality for drug addicts and alcoholics and one that included it in the treatment process. And they found out that by including spirituality in the treatment process, they had better results. Mm. And so that's what we do. We, we also include that. We happen to have a, a spirituality, a, more of a Christian-based program. But um, generally speaking, if you don't include spirituality in it, the results are, tend to be poorer. And that's what we do. Wonderful. Well, I know that you uh, have come down here and you've had some great results and great things down there. And so I know that you're speaking from a lot of experience and have p dealt with a lot of these things firsthand. Yes. And so thank you so much for taking time to be down here today. My pleasure. And uh, for all of you watching at home today, we're speaking about family. And our first issue is pornography's relationship to marital relations. Um, if you do have children, this is a PG program, just so you are aware. And Michael, this is something that a lot of people want to talk about, but they don't want to talk about. It's also something that's kind of sweeping the country. And if you look, look at statistics, it's staggering the amount of really a, an addiction to pornography, um, especially internet pornography that's out there today. What is its relationship to, to, to marriages and to committed relationships? Well, in my experience, like particularly over the last 10 years, the problem has kind of gone up exponentially. And the problem is based on the fact that what you just said, it's, it's the easy access to the internet that's causing the problem. And it's not only hitting the parents, it's also now filtered down to the children. It's very common now for children, even in grade school, to be on internet pornography. And in my experience, I've never had anything productive come out of it, out of pornography in the family, or even if couples, if they both agree to using it, including that in their marital relations. Generally speaking, there, is, there can be a short-term fix for their uh, sex life and their love life, but then later on it usually goes very bad. Pornography has too many negative aspects for anybody to actually get involved in it. So what I try to do in, in the counseling process is wean the people off of it if they're casual or situational users. If the person's addicted to pornography, now that's, a, a, so to speak, a horse of a different color, and that requires a lot more work and a lot more therapy. Wow, and so you mentioned school-age children and statistically it's showing kids as young as 10 and 12 now are yes. beginning to be addicted to pornography. Very, it's very common. What, what do you think is, is causing that? I mean, that, that's something I know that when I was 10 and 12 years old, that was not something that even crossed my mind. I was playing in the cul-de-sac and riding my bike with my friends. I mean, yes. we, didn't, we didn't think about those things. Mm -mm. So. Do, do you think that that's a societal thing? Do you think that it's, it, what, what do you think could be causing that in your opinion? There, it's, it's based on two factors. Number one, our society over the last 25 years or so has gone very sexualized. And TV shows, sitcoms, marketing, everything seems to have a sensual connotation to it. In fact, I saw a, a dog food ad a couple of weeks ago that had kind of a sensual marketing ploy to it. And the second thing is what we've already discussed the internet has really changed the planet. And the internet, as you know, has all kinds of good things on it. It's, it's fantastic, but it also has this very dark component to it. And the easy access to it is what's really causing the problem. 
as can you imagine, I'm a senior citizen, and you just mentioned what you did as a child. We had, when I was little, no, no access like no, this of any kind to it. And now our society is, it's right on your phone. Click, click, and it's right there. Grade schoolers, everybody is exposed to it. What, what is something parents can do to help avoid that happening with their children? Because, I mean, we're in just a second here, we're going to get into the effects that pornography has on your life and your future relationships, your current relationship. That is destroying a generation of young people. And it's not just men now, it's women as well that are struggling with this. What can parents do to help avoid that? Because that's literally going to destroy a relationship of young people that are coming into growing up and is now beginning relationships and it skews the way that they perceive things. So how can Very parents much. how can parents help avoid that or if that's already becoming a problem, what would be your advice to them to help? The the first advice is working on the parents. If they have any exposure to sensuality, sexuality and pornography, that's gotta be gotta be corrected because if they're involved in anything, then it just naturally flows down to the children. Yes. The second thing is there's not much they can do because children are exposed to so much more now than I was as a child. It's much more difficult now to control people, particularly your kids. There's so many avenues of exposure to it. Uh, a parent really can't stop it. So maybe it has just... to come from the integrity and the character of each individual person. Wow. And maybe just being more involved with your kids, talking to them, knowing what they're doing, probably watching for comments from them and behaviors and things because I know that one of the side effects of it is whenever you're involved in that, that the way that you talk and the way you communicate and the way you do things starts to change. Yes. And so maybe just watching that as parents and paying attention. If your 12 year old is making a sensual joke, you know, that they would otherwise have no idea about, maybe mm -hmm. be like, hold on just a second, what's happening, what's going on, mm -hmm. and being aware. Exactly. Um, so getting into the actual pornography relationship to marital relations, um, you, you, you wrote down several issues that it causes, and this is something that, first of all, if there's someone watching that either has a family member or you're struggling with something like this, you're, people aren't alone. I mean, this is something that many people are struggling with of all ages. It doesn't matter what sex you are or what relationship you're in or anything. A lot of people are struggling with it, but Very it's much. important to know the issues that, are, that, that go along with with partaking in it. Um, so I, I have a list here, but would you go through some of them just yourself? What are these, what, are, what is pornography doing to people that it's affecting in their relationships? Well, the main issue that I run into is statistically, it's more skewed toward males than females. And if they're married, the problems uh, start to manifest in the wife because she's sensing, and rightly so, that uh, the person may not physically be you need to use a slang term, cheating on them, they are, in fact, emotionally doing it. And the wives usually come in first, and they usually go through a kind of a laundry list of how their husband has changed, how their love life has changed, how his attitude toward her has changed, how the care and affection has changed, and much of that can be traced back to pornography because the system kind of dehumanizes females and in a way kind of turns them into a commodity instead of a person. Into an object. Into an object, yes. And that's, that's the beginning of the breakdown of the relationship. The relationship is supposed to be built on love and affection and mutual trust and integrity and pornography represents kind of the opposite of all those things. It encourages people to not get married. It encourages them not to be monogamous. It encourages them to kind of see someone as a satisfaction machine or something that you're designed to make me feel what I need to feel. And when that process starts, then the personal aspects of the relationship start to wow. deteriorate. And I would imagine that if it's a if they're if these people are already married and they're just, one of the partners is just starting to watch this, um, they're probably almost ashamed, and so it probably breaks down the trust in the relationship because they're not going to say it or they're not going to speak it, and so it becomes something that's hidden away from them. Is that is that a common thing? Because or is this something that people just willingly say that they're doing? No, generally speaking, I, I usually hear from the wives, 
and it's usually after they've, quote, been, the husband's been discovered. Ah, they've been and caught. And they come to find out yeah. we've had a long-term issue here that the other spouse isn't aware of. So now there's a breach of trust. There's a shame factor. Then there's the blame myself issue that come, tends to come on the wife, where they're looking at themselves and they kind of believe these lies that I'm not good enough, I'm not pretty enough, I'm not sensual enough, I'm not athletic enough, I'm not something else. And then they start to develop a series of bad insecurities. Wow. And then their relationship really starts to deteriorate from there, particularly if the husband refuses to stop doing it, which wow. is normally the case. They normally refuse to stop doing it because now it's ingrained into their soul and in their emotions, and they're kind of using it as an escape. Pornography, generally speaking, is kind of like any other drug, alcohol, drugs, food. It's a fantasy world that a person can leave and enter, and they're this other person in there. And so they use it kind of as, it's, it's a kind of a form of an escape. Wow, and I know that there's been some research that I have looked at that shows that it's particularly the internet pornography because it's so easily accessible and you can get so many different kinds it's at, at the click of a button um, it, it, it it affects the same part of the brain that cocaine affects and yes. the different drugs affect yes. so this is truly something that you'll often hear people say and I've spoken with friends who've dealt with these issues and you know it's just, it's not hurting anybody. It's not hurting anybody, but it, it is. And something that starts out as a casual thing and you think, mm -hmm. oh, I'm just doing this to, you know, get my mind off of something, it can really truly become a problem. No question. And it's kind of what's what psychologists call systematic desensitization. Once you get exposed to something on a repetitive basis, as you're repetitively exposed to it, the negativity about it diminishes so that it, it becomes more just another thing. And so once the person is deep into it, they don't have the same feelings or sensings that they had when they first started it, which was, hey, wait a minute, this is, this is not good. You're betraying your spouse. This is risky. They lose all those inhibitions as they, you know, in a way, kind of sink into the system. Wow. And so it's something for women to watch for, and even women that are dating that maybe aren't married yet. I remember I brought this conversation up with a mutual friend not too long ago, and she kind of made a sly joke in a way and just said, well, aren't all men addicted to pornography, and kind of laughed it off. And to me, I've done research about it. I, I know how serious it is. That was kind of just almost a, a hit to my chest, like, wow, women are so willing to just, meh, it's not a big deal. What, what should women look for, and is that something that you should be concerned about before you decide to get married to someone, which should be a, you know, a lifelong commitment and all of these things? Is that something that should be addressed before you make that decision, because it will be brought into the marriage? Well, there's no, there's no doubt about it. In fact, it's, now, uh, it's so prevalent now that a lot of prenuptial agreements are putting it in there. Really? That pornography is to be avoided. If you, if you go to pornography, you're going to have reduced benefits in the event of a divorce. Wow. It's that serious now. But the, the real issue in pornography is the change in the person's reaction to the spouse. Okay, the, the girls that you mentioned there, uh, they're ignorant because they haven't been exposed to it in a personal relationship over a long period of time. If you're exposed to it through people that you're dating, the real negative impact of it is not realized by the person. As you're married over a period of years, then the nightmare starts to come into effect. The person starts to leave the spouse and want to stay in this fantasy world where they are these master lovers and the women are there just to cater to them. And it's all about this wonderful experience. And as you know, in any area of life, that's, life is not like that. No. And it's, that's a fantasy, not reality. And what happens is the wife starts to notice lack of affection, a lack of interest, lack of interest in the children, a lack of love, secrecy, integrity issues. All these things start to manifest as the person kind of sinks deeper into the system. Wow. And so what, just as closing on this first topic, what would you suggest to someone who really is either struggling with themselves and wants help 
or someone that maybe is in a relationship with someone that, that, that is sensing there's something wrong, what would you suggest to them to do to start in the process of hopefully helping themselves or helping their loved one? First of all, realize that they are not a bad or evil person. This happens to everybody. And people that you wouldn't even dream are on, involved in pornography are. Yeah. Secondly, go get some help because if you've been in the system for a long time, you're, you're going to have a very difficult time, almost impossible, of getting out of it because now it's entrenched mentally, it's entrenched emotionally. It's become part of you. In a way, it's got these hooks in your soul. And don't be ashamed to go get help because this problem is so prevalent now that Everybody who's involved in it can get help and should get help. And it's not something to be humiliated or ashamed about. Right. That's why people don't come and get help. They feel guilty. They feel embarrassed. They feel weak. And as long as they feel that way, they won't come for counseling. They won't get any help. Well, and especially something of that nature, especially with someone involved in any kind of religious aspect or a point of position of power or something, they probably feel embarrassed. embarrassed and ashamed, especially about something of that nature where even though as sexualized as our society has become, there's still things that are taboo to bring up to things, you know, and to really talk about. And so just for them to understand that they can get help and that it is a problem. <laughs> no question. Just because nobody's getting hurt, as they say. That's, that's always the thing I hear, and it always just makes me... Well, that, that's a lie, actually. It is Somebody a lie. somewhere is always getting hurt, and it's usually emotional, and it's mental, and we haven't even t discussed today the deeper aspects of pornography, which are the really emotionally ill area where you're into sadomasochism and bestiality and these other things. What we've discussed today is just like normal pornography you would find in a heterosexual marriage. Unfortunately, the, that leads to those other things you were mentioning, and I wish we had the time to go into those, and I'll have to have you back and discuss some of those issues. But thank you so much for joining us for this first segment. No, my Michael. privilege. And uh, for all of you at home, please don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after this short message. If it's that bad, why doesn't she just leave? This is the wrong question. Abusers stalk, harass, and threaten their partners, often linking escalation with deadly outcomes. So next time before you ask, why doesn't she just leave? Instead ask this question, why is anyone allowed to terrorize their own family? And maybe more importantly, why aren't we doing more about it? It's time to start asking the right questions. Hello and welcome back to Joy in Our Town. I'm your host, Vanessa Rose. Thank you so much for staying with us for this second portion. And today we are speaking about family. We are joined by Michael W. Smith, who is a licensed counselor at House of Healing here in Phoenix. And our second issue is the addictive personality. Um, Michael, this is something that we could speak about related to pornography and just really in general. That it, whenever you say an addictive personality, this is something you've heard. I've used this term for people that I know. Um, is that something that's genetic or is that something that's kind of a cause and effect from, from life? Well, now that's a debatable subject, but in my experience, um, I've been a counselor here in Phoenix for 34 years. This is my 34th year. Generally speaking, it's environmental. Now there's some research that indicates that uh, a person may have an abnormal dopamine issue, mm -hmm. but generally speaking, no, it's environmental. And there's, it's kind of a bifurcated issue. You have a person that has an addictive personality, then you have an addictive personality disorder. Okay, these are the same thing, but one is more severe than the other, the latter. Generally speaking, you're gonna run into somebody that has what we call an addictive personality. And the roots of that are usually, you can usually trace that back to childhood. And what happens is at some time, preschool, grade school, junior high, something happens to the person very negative, um, rejection, abandonment, a divorce, some kind of an emotional trauma, maybe verbal abuse, severe sexual abuse, something happens when they're younger and the person starts to develop improper or poor coping mechanisms. And, those and that kicks in when they're young and then as they keep as they grow up, wow. they continue to use these bad coping mechanisms to kind of mask this internal pain 
that they picked up when they were young. Generally speaking, that's how the process works. And so each person uh, kind of develops their own different addictions, but what the person is getting out of it is an instant sense of comfort or satisfaction due to negative stimulus, either in the soul or external pressure, stress in their life. They learned through a pattern of maladaptive behaviors to move over to a quick, I need a quick comfort. And so they, you know, the addictions are different, but it could be alcohol, drugs, sex, food, gambling. There's all kinds of different uh, things that people choose. And that's usually mental and it's usually accessibility related. But the root of it is usually something here in the soul where the person has learned over the years of, of, through a bad behavior pattern to start using a bad coping mechanism instead of a healthy one. So if someone is that way and they have had trauma and hurt in their life and this is something 20, 30, 40 years of their life they've been you know, adapting to new. And I think probably with age and like you said with accessibility, those addictive tendencies might change and go from one thing or to the other. Um, how, how do you, is that something that they can go back? I mean, 20, 30 years and change those behaviors and truly find a change in their life? Or is that something that's going to be an issue and they're gonna struggle with the rest of their life? Because 20, 30 years, I mean, you heard that, you know, you hear the old saying, you know, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. And, you know, old habits, they, they don't go away easily. And right. so is that something that truly can change? Yes and no. Uh, to, to answer your question, if the person is left alone to do it themselves, the probability is no. Now, you mentioned something that was interesting. You mentioned a habit. Habits are different than addictions. A habit can be stopped mentally. And an addiction is mental and emotional. Mm. So in, a counts in the counseling session, a habit is easier to help someone overcome than an addiction. And here's how it works. I know this is going to sound kind of spooky, but the human mind can be programmed to run automatically. And uh, the military knows that. People that have cults know that. And positive uh, power of positive thinking, Tony Robbins, he knows mm -hmm. that. People can program their mind to run automatically, positively, or negatively. And once the mind is trained through a habit over a period of time, at a certain point, the mind starts to run automatically. Or the slang term is, somebody so-and-so's got a one-track mind. Hmm. What's happening there is that their mind is now running automatically. And so the person breaking that cycle by themselves without any help is almost close, it's close to impossible, but it's not impossible. Some people have very, very strong wills and can sit down and uh, uh, break that cycle. But generally speaking, no. They can't do it by themselves. They're gonna need some help. You mentioned one thing is, is childhood issues, divorce, um, hurt, and the accessibility to things. And just to brush on that as an addiction, um, the issue we were just speaking about, which is pornography, is that something that maybe you think, I mean, if you look at the divorce rates in America, they're through the roof. If there, it's over a 50% divorce right now. Um, all kinds of issues that go along with that, whether or not people want to admit it, it does affect children emotionally and it affects everyone in their life. Um, do you feel that maybe that has an effect on the reason that we're seeing kids as young and 10 as 12 being addicted to things like internet pornography because they're looking for something to cope and they come from a family maybe where they're not gonna have drugs or alcohol or something of that nature to be able to get onto. And so do you think that maybe that has an effect on the numbers that we're seeing now? Oh, there's no question about it. And again, the, the process is kind of the same. The person as a, as a child or as a young adult is hurt real bad and they develop a certain systems for making themselves feel better because nobody can live in chronic emotional pain all the time. That usually leads to, uh, you know, another show and another subject, suicide. Yes. Okay? So every person by nature has to do something about this internal emotional pain. 
And so when the person starts to develop bad habits, which lead to an addiction, what they're really doing is trying to get out of this way I feel, the negativity, the self-disgust, the self-hatred, the self-pity, the bad feelings about themselves that they had picked up as a child. So what I do in the counseling session is using spirituality. I go back there and work through each of those incidents that I'm aware of and let the person understand that their assumptions and their beliefs about this incident and that one and this one and that one are actually false and then show them how that pain is related to this behavior now. Wow. Which the person's unaware of. And so that's why a lot of times professional help is needed because yes. it's difficult to look at ourselves in the mirror and say, this is wrong with you because of right. this issue. <laughs> yeah, by if nature. If only life worked that way, right? <laughs> by, by nature, we, we are kind of blind to ourselves and are kind of, by nature, just kind of see it in others clearly, but can't see it in ourselves. Yeah. It's perfectly it's like normal. like that one thing, I give great advice, but I don't take it. <laughs> anyway, right. well, exactly. Michael, right. thank you so much. It, our time always goes so quickly uh, and enjoyed it. always thank have you. great information. So thank you for joining us. And thank you so very much at home for joining us here on Joy in Our Town. As always, we enjoy being with you and spending time in your home. And we look forward to seeing you right here next week. This program has been sponsored by the Trinity Broadcasting Network and is made possible by your telephone dollars. Your continual support can keep Joy in Our Town coming to your home every week. Write to Joy in Our Town, Post Office Box A, Santa Ana, California, 92711.